Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to Modern and Modest with myself Noshina Ghani and a very interesting guest with us today. And as you can see the sun is out, it's a beautiful winter morning here in Durban and I'm sure most of you guys are very jealous right now and you wish you could be here with us in Durban. So today we have an audiologist but there's more to just an audiologist with Teskin Amir. Assalamu alaikum Teskin and welcome to Modern and Modest. Wa alaikum salam, thank you for having me. <laughs> Only a pleasure. So the skin, um, I've been reading up about the skin, Amir, and I've learned a few things about you. And I must say, there's not just audiology to the skin. So maybe you can tell our viewers more about yourself and the background, and just more about the skin, Amir. How you got into audiology, and and what's what is there to you? Um, so I'm from Durban. Um, I currently work at a special school, uh, St. Martin de Poirier School for Intellectually Disabled and Deaf Children in Pochepston. Mm -hmm. um, so I travel there uh, during the week, I stay there and then I come back on Fridays to Durban. Um, yeah, it's been really great working at the school, something that I've always wanted to do because I love working with children mm -hmm. um, and I've always had an interest in the deaf community as well. Besides that, I also um, run a fashion page on Instagram called The Broke Shopaholic mm -hmm. and recently started a new project uh, with my friends called Together Nest where we're trying to create awareness about people with disabilities. Okay. Um, yeah. So definitely lots of dedication with having to travel on the weekends, being home and, yeah. and Monday to Friday. So the skin, you, you mentioned intellectually deaf children and is it just a school for children? Uh, do you see adults that you, that you, uh, mm -hmm. that are deaf and that you actually offer your services to? So I, when I studied audiology, I finished my degree in 2014 mm -hmm. and then I did my community service at Ishawe District Hospital. So there I got a lot of clinical experience and I did work with a lot of adults, majority okay. adults there. Um, thereafter, I got the job at St. Martin School. Um, so that um, is basically me working with children, which I love doing. So I only see kids. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so there's intellectually disabled children. There's two sections, intellectually disabled children and deaf children. So as an audiologist, my focus is mo mostly on uh, working with the deaf children um, at this point, yeah. Um, now with you being such a creative person, obviously with launching this Broke Shopaholic and, and wanting to keep people together with togetherness, what prompted you to wanting to set out in audiology? So I actually was starting, uh, studying speech therapy first. I did my work experience uh, during the trick with a speech therapist mm -hmm. um, uh, and I also applied for speech therapy. I didn't think of audiology at all, um, but during first year, um, the speech therapy and audiology modules, <clears throat> they are, the modules were the same. And I found that I was enjoying the audiology modules a lot more. So I ended up just swapping over to audiology. And I think another reason that I uh, wanted to do audiology was because of my grandfather. So he suffers with a very severe hearing loss and I saw how it affected him from the time I've been a kid. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt like I wanted to do something to help him, which eventually I was able to do through my career. Yeah. You mentioned like, I mean, you enjoy working with children as opposed to working with adults and I'm sure most of us would because children get you to smile or they make yes, your day every yeah. day. But are there any challenges that you find you face having to um, spend time with a, a deaf child as opposed to a deaf adult? Who do you think is more challenging for you to work with? I, I, do, I, I can't really say. I think both would, there are challenges with both. Um, but I think the concern in the profession of audiology right now with children is that a lot of kids are identified late with hearing loss. So that is one of the biggest challenges that we do face because of the lack of equipment at hospitals. Um, you know, the testing that should be done when kids are born mm. is not being done at all hospitals. So we do get a lot of kids that are identified late okay. with hearing loss. So when they're identified late, that means um, intervention takes place late. Um, so things like teaching them sign language or fitting hearing aids on at an early age is done at a later stage. Mm -hmm. And that affects their progress as a whole. Um, so something that we continue to advocate for is early um, screening for kids and um, uh, hearing tests done, should be done when kids are, uh, when a child is born. 
Um, so newborn hearing screening is something that um, a lot of audiologists advocate for. So I'm just going to interrupt you there. You mentioned newborn uh, screening. Is this done at hospitals that you deliver at or is it a service that we need to request for? How does, okay, I mean, so as, as a mum, I, I can't should, remember my kids having yeah, a hearing okay. screening. So it should be done at hospitals. Um, but unfortunately, like I said, a lot of the hospitals don't have the equipment. Okay. Um, so that is a big, that's, that's where the problem is lying. Um, I also volunteer with another program called High Hopes. Okay. So they are an um, organization which offers um, free um, early intervention services to uh, families who have children who are deaf or hard of hearing. So what they do is once a child is diagnosed with a hearing loss, um, the child would be referred to the High Hopes organization and they assign the family a home interventionist. So the home interventionist basically goes in and provides the family with um, strategies and techniques and information that they may require. Um, yeah, so that is something that is being done, uh, you know, in the South African context to um, basically alleviate this problem of uh, children not receiving early intervention. So, um, yeah, basically for the home interventionist, you have to go through a training. So they usually uh, do a training with you. And it's not only for audiologists, it's actually open to anybody who has a passion for working with kids. Mm -hmm. So you go for this training and you become a home interventionist and then you assign a family and basically you visit that family every two weeks and anything that the family may need, whether they maybe need help with mm -hmm. uh, uh, explanation of what are hearing aids or what are audiograms where we do um, our hearing tests okay. um, or how can they stimulate language development. Um, the home interventionist would provide that information to the family. And the best thing about that is that it's done in the home environment. So it doesn't require the family to go out or sure. buy anything. Everything is done in the home environment. It's teaching them skills that they can use within their home um, to uh, basically stimulate the child and help with their language and overall development. Okay. Yeah. Now we know from being at school and uh, our kiddies being at school, what we know what is a day like for a usual teacher teaching kids as opposed to someone like yourself that teaches intellectually deaf kids? What, what is your day like when you start out to end? What do you do with these wonderful kids at your school? Okay, so my day would basically be, I start off usually um, going around to the classes and checking hearing aids for those who have hearing aids. Um, and then I also do yearly assessments, so annual assessments for the children in the deaf section. So what happens is they have to have their hearing assessed every year just to check if, they, if they, um, the, hearing, the hearing loss has gotten worse or has it stayed the same, any changes. So that's done on an annual basis. And also I do therapy with the kids. So I do class therapy or individual therapy um, where I basically go to the classes mm -hmm. and st uh, do um, therapy with them, you know, targeting areas that they may be struggling with or the teachers would come and indicate areas that the kids are struggling with. Um, yeah, so basically that's my day. And then I do get referrals, you know, if kids have ear infections, um, any problems like that also comes to me, yeah. Okay. <laughs> So away from audiology now, tell us more about Together Nest. I love the name. I mean, it mm. says it all. It's a nest of people being together and the togetherness. Yes, uh, maybe yes. how did the name come up? Where did you come up with Together Nest? And what is Together Nest all about? Yeah, so basically, I'm so glad that you understood <laughs> um, the logo and everything yeah. like that. But um, so how this actually started was I'm very passionate about um, sign language and the deaf community. Mm. I think I've learned so much working at a school for children who are deaf. I've learned so much, not just from the kids, but my deaf colleagues, and I've been really inspired by them. So um, Togetherness basically started, I was a talk sign ambassador for the KZN Blind and Deaf Society um, for their talk sign campaign, which takes place in March every year. Okay. So that campaign is basically about creating awareness about sign language and the deaf community. And as an ambassador, I wanted to use the skills that I learned at school um, with sign language and offer that service to people in the community. And we hosted a class, sign language class, and the response that we got was so positive. And I had two friends who were also on board that came to help out. 
and we found that we really enjoyed doing that. And thereafter, we said, okay, we, we had a lot of requests from people. Um, when is your next class? Or are you having another one? So we said, okay, let's do another class. So we did a second one, and again, the response was really positive. So from there, we decided, um, okay, we really work well together, and we, you know, we don't just want to do this once mm -hmm. a year, we want to do it maybe monthly and yes. offer the service to people because we realize that so many people actually want to learn sign language but they're not sure where to go sure. or who to ask for help. Um, so we came, we sat down and we discussed, you know, ideas. So the other two ladies that are on board, or other three ladies, sorry, um, there is a Caitlin Wakefield. She is an audiologist as well. She works at Quatinta School for the Deaf. Mm -hmm. And then we have Mary Subramani. She's a teacher. She's been teaching for about 10 years. And she's currently at Durban School for the Hearing Impaired. And then my sister, Raisa Amir, and she's an accountant and currently a management accounting student. Okay. So the four of us sat together and we discussed, like, we want to create awareness about people with disabilities and start a conversation, sure. you know, bridge that gap between um, two communities, get people talking, um, you know, talk about what are the struggles, what are they going through, how can we help? Um, and then because we come from a background of deaf education, yes. we said our first um, thing that we're going to target or create awareness about is going to be sign language. So that's how we started with Togetherness. Um, so we actually offer classes to people uh, in the community for free. Um, so at the moment, we uh, put out our dates for sign language classes. So we have a set of four dates. The first one was actually done on the 29th of can, June. Can we, we're going to take a quick ad break and then you can perhaps share those dates with yes, us yeah. and hopefully be able to teach us simple sign yes, language yeah. and our viewers can then connect Definitely. with those people yes, that yeah, yeah. need some type of communication or togetherness, like yes, you said. Yeah. We'll take a quick ad break and when back we'll be chatting more to Tazki and Amir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to Modern and Modest with myself, Lushina Ghani and Taskeen Amir. So Taskeen, just before the ad break, we were chatting about togetherness and this platform that you've created and it's some free classes that you offer to the public just mm -hmm. to teach us more about sign language. And you mentioned that you offer these classes for free and you have four upcoming dates. Mm -hmm. yes. Would you be able to share those dates with us? Okay, please? so we have the first date on the 20, the 29th of June was the first class. Okay. Um, and then our next date is going to be the 13th July. Then thereafter it will be the, the 23rd of July and then the 3rd of August. Um, and basically it's done every two weeks. And we have two venues. So the first venue is the Nelson Mandela Chatswood Youth Center. Um, so that's, that class is done at half past nine to half past 11. And then we have um, our second venue, which is UKZ and Howard College. So we go there from half past one to half past three. So yeah, it's open to anybody from the public who wants to learn sign language can just message us. We're on Instagram, we're on Facebook. Um, they can even email us, all our details are there, um, and they can RSVP, um, just so we know the numbers and who's coming. Sure. Um, yeah, so those are the classes, um, the dates that are set. And then on the 24th of August, we're going to have a social. So what will happen is all the people who attended these classes will be invited to the social, and it's basically about people using the skills that they learned. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we want people to actually put into practice all the signs that they use, because it's different learning it in a class and then actually communicating with people. And then we're going to invite our deaf uh, colleagues and friends to also join us. And it's just going to be fun and getting people, seeing people using their sign language skills. Um, yeah. And we're also open to doing pop-up classes. So if people can't come to our venues, uh, maybe there's a business or institution that wants to learn sign language, we are open to coming to that venue um, and providing uh, uh, like a once-off class, teaching alphabets, basic words and phrases. So we are also open to doing that as well. Um, and once we're done with these set-up classes, we'll do another, we'll start another set. Um, but this time it will be in a different area. Like we've had requests from people to come to certain areas. Mm -hmm. So once we get a venue in those areas, then we'll go out to those so, venues. So how many classes would one need to attend to, to feel more confident in 
So yeah, skills. so every class covers different vocab. So every week um, we do a revision of the previous vocab, and then we also give you new new vocab. Mm -hmm. So it, every week you're building up on the previous vocab. Um, so it is recommended to attend all the four classes because, like in the first class, we're doing basic words and phrases, and then alphabets, and then the second week we do cover different topics. So. It is recommended to attend all the classes, but we are, you know, we're not fussy about that. Um, sometimes people are not available or work schedules and stuff. We totally understand. Um, it is up to the person if they choose to attend four or three or two. It's up to them as long as we're able to assist in uh, sharing information on sign language in any way. Yeah, it's a great initiative. <laughs> all right. So ideally, we need to do this full set of four classes yes. because we start building basic and then obviously yes. to intermediate. Yeah. I guess then you have all the sign language skills <laughs> required. So just keep just moving away from the togetherness. I know there's more to you and I, this would definitely be my favorite <laughs> and every woman's favorite, the Broke Shopaholic. Uh, tell us about Broke Shopaholic and the name is just so inspiring and yeah, just tell us more about it. So that. I love shopping um, and I'm always broke. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I, I've always had people tell me that, you know, they like mm. the outfit that I'm wearing or the clothes or shoes, whatever it is. And they'd always get so surprised when I tell them where I got the outfit from or how much it cost. Um, and for me, I felt like I was on Instagram or Facebook and I would see a lot of influencers sharing their outfits or accessories. Um, and I mean, I love what they're doing, but I felt like it wasn't becoming relatable. And you know, I'd click on the uh, the price of that handbag or that outfit, and I was like, oh my word, that's the same amount as my rent, <laughs> you know. Okay. So I was like, okay, this is not really relatable to me. Mm. And I was like, you know, for the everyday girl working on a budget, I wanted to create something that is relatable and where they can say, okay, you know, I can get, I can look and wear this outfit without breaking the bank, sure. basically. Um, so on my page, I share um, when there's sales, where there's bargains, um, share tips and advice. And I also allow the people who are viewing my page to share their advice or their outfits that they've gotten on a budget or uh, any ad uh, fashion advice or shops that they have seen where offers um, clothing or items which are on sale or at bargain prices. So yeah, I try to make it interactive as well. I'm yeah. sure so many women are grateful to that because <laughs> everyone wants to look great and we don't want to break the bank, yeah. of course. But I think when we chat about fashion in itself, fashion isn't about price or having the yes. best. Fashion is about putting a piece together and yes. getting the best out of it. Yes. And and as women, uh, every woman's got some form of creative styling yes. within them and it's just about Definitely. putting it together. So how long has this been around for? When have you launched Shop? So I, actually, <laughs> so I actually uh, celebrated the one year anniversary on the 10th, which was yesterday. So yeah, it's been one year since I launched. And you know, the best part about it is when I started, I was so scared. Mm -hmm. But the support that I got from other women and the encouragement that I got from other women was so positive. And so many girls would message and say, you know, they also love sales and they also love bargains and they're so happy, you know. And, you know, people would say, um, if I put up sale items or things that are on a budget, they would always message and say, thank you, you know, I didn't know that this was on, or I didn't know I could go here to get an item. So the response that I've gotten has been really positive, yeah. Okay. So just before we get on to, sign, you know, going back to togetherness, because uh, I'd love you to share some type of sign language for our viewers. But I was browsing through your page and you had something, a very, very interesting concept and you ran a competition. Tell us more about this competition and where did this idea pop up? So I ran a competition called Recreate the Look South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, uh, I asked people to, you know, take a celebrity's outfit and recreate it, but you know, in their own way and preferably on a budget. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to show people that, you know, you can also look um, as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can yeah. look just like that, but you don't have to break the bank. It can just yes. be um, you looking around. Like my favorite place to shop is China Mall. Like okay. I love going there. Yeah. There's so many great clothing shops, even uh, things for like decor, mm -hmm. They have everything there. So that's one of my favorite places to shop. So I want women to celebrate that. I think sometimes you kind of fall into this 
um, there's a lot of pressure for on brand names yeah. and expensive items where I want women to celebrate and be proud of, you know, okay, I bought this, it was 50 Rand or it was, you know, it doesn't and matter it how, it's yeah, amazing, right? yeah, yeah, that's the thing. You can't put a price on fashion or style. Sure. It's how you create it. Um, and that's what I wanted to show other women as well. Yeah. So coming back to togetherness and the sign language, would you be able to share just a few basic, uh, yeah. what is it, sign yes. skills, sign yeah. language skills with our viewers? So at least when we meet someone that's that's yes. hard of hearing, we're yeah. able to have a conversation or communicate with that. I leave you to our viewers. Okay, yeah. Viewers. No, I definitely would love to do that. Um, so one of the first signs I think everybody wants to know is how to say hello. Mm. So the how you say hello is hello. Hello. Um, and then you can say, how are you? How are you? The thing with sign language is also the facial expressions are really important as well. Body language is important. Um, you have to make sure that you are facing the person you're communicating with, making eye contact. Um, that's really important as well. Um, another sign is thank you. Thank you. Or please. 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 Um, uh, another um, thing that I would recommend for people to learn is the alphabets, the sign language alphabets. It is available on our um, uh, page on Instagram and Facebook, but it's also available on the internet. Okay. So the alphabets I, I would recommend people learning because it's a great tool to have and it's the foundation. Just like sure. in um, the English language, your alphabets are your foundation. The same applies for sign language. Yes. A lot of signs are built from the sign language alphabet. Um, so learning the alphabet would be really helpful and is a starting point and also um, it helps when you know if you're communicating with a person who is deaf and just say you maybe forgot a sign or you're not sure of a sign you can spell it and then the person who is deaf will be able to show you the actual sign for it so it's a really great tool to have yeah and just uh, sample out a few letters for us oh a few letters yeah. okay so this is A B okay. C D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. Okay, so I'm yeah. sure in your class you'd start out with yes. your foundation with your alphabets and yeah. that's how you'd probably be able to build words um, for them. Yes, definitely. That's the first thing we cover, yeah. Alright, and is there anything else you'd like to share with our viewers? I mean, uh, the Togetherness program seems quite close to your heart. Yeah. And where would you like to see this platform going and what would you like to share with our viewers, how could we as a community get involved with this? Um, so the first thing I would like people to do is, you know, to follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Um, our Instagram handle is togethernest underscore SA and on Facebook we also um, togethernest SA and our email is togethernest04 at gmail.com. So we'd love for people to contact us if they would like to learn sign language, feel free to contact us. Um, you know, we are open to having more classes, like I said, um, in different areas. We do need venues, so that's something we do ask people in the community for, to assist with the venues, um, sponsoring venues for us. Um, yeah, but we really would like more people to join in and spread the message about Togetherness. You know, we do have a vision, a bigger picture of what we want to do. We also are fo going to focus on other disabilities as well. We want to create awareness about all disabilities. So in that, is, that is the bigger picture that we are aiming for. Um, yeah, and we're also looking at hopefully creating a channel where we upload our sign language videos with the signs that we, the vocab that we cover in our classes. We're hoping to make videos so that people who come to the class, you know, they can go back to the channel um, or Facebook or Instagram and view the videos with the vocab and practice as well. So that is, um, you know, the bigger goal at the end. Yeah. So this skin, what message would you like to share with our viewers just before we wrap up? Okay, so I do have a message for the youth out there. I think um, so often um, as young people, especially when you're still in school, there's so much of pressure to just 
be focused on one career or one goal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this pressure on you either become a doctor, lawyer, accountant. But yeah, I just wanted to tell people that you know you can be whatever you want to be. Um, you don't have to be um, just focused on one thing. The the world out there has so many opportunities, and you know it's you don't have to have just one dream. So um, if you're a doctor but you love painting, you know pursue it. You know there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and I always tell myself, and this is something that I um, remind myself every time I want to try something new. You know people, we I think we as society we worry too much about what other people are going to mm. think. Um, so what I tell myself is, you know, it's better to try than to not try at all. Um, so, you know, you try and you fail, it's fine, you carry on. So that's something that I keep reminding myself on and uh, so something that I remind myself about every time I want to try something new. Um, so try and fail and, you know, take it off your list. Okay, I did it, it didn't work. Instead of sitting one day and having that what if um, question should I have done that should I have gotten that job should I have pursued that every time every time you want to pursue a dream or a goal just do it um, and try fail and then try again it's fine yeah <laughs> okay well thanks for being on our show that was very informative and I'm sure so many of us would benefit from the little you've showed us on sign language. That was Taskeen Amir and like she said, uh, try and fail but rather try than not trying at all. And yeah. we'll be taking a quick ad break and when back we'll be chatting to our next guest. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to Margin and Majest with myself, Noshina Ghani and Sonali Haradial. So yes. Sonali, before we even start with the show, are you from Durban, out of Durban? So I've lived in Durban from the time I was born. Um, I'm originally from Pollock. My entire family is from Pollock, so it's just myself, my mom, my dad and my sister. Okay. So Sonali, you, you know, when we read up about Sonali and we want to know more about Sonali Haradiyal, it comes up as pause and paint and yes. wearing a masterpiece. Now, two amazing titles. Thank and you. tell us more about it. What, is it linked together? What is pause and paint? What is wearing a masterpiece? So, so pause and paint is an implication of art therapy, which is started up in London a few years ago for cancer patients. And many kids suffering with illnesses and um, anxiety and depression etc so in order to run art therapy you have to have a psychology degree and a artistic degree so it's not necessarily being a fine artist it's just knowing how to help people express their feelings through art um, so I am a BCom law student so I'm nowhere close to having a fine arts degree or psychology degree um, However, art has been a passion of mine. So it was about four years ago, my first year of campus, um, there was an article in the newspaper regarding looking for people to help paint um, murals for kids in King George Hospital here in Durban. Mm -hmm. And um, so one of my family members saw it and then she's like, no, so now you have to do it because I've been painting from like grade two, which was a long time ago. Okay. Um, and uh, when I saw that, I was like, okay, I'm there. Because in my family, my parents always taught us to throw out both our hands when it comes to helping. So this was a absolutely voluntary initiative. So I went into it and um, there was about four of us, the four artists, and there was five walls to cover. And the one wall was to cover the process of TB, like literally painting, the coughing, the opening of windows, what medication, everything. The other wall was the Nelson Mandela wall that I did, um, which was a mural of him, in a sense where the kids know that he is an influencer, he is a role model, he did have TB, and there's a good outcome to everything. And the other process was, um, when you're done with your treatment, this is what you can do. You can go to the park, you can go back to school, you can be with your family, etc. And the second wall that I did was a wall of hope. And that was praying hands and birds and the sun, etc. So while doing that, I think I spent like three months in the hospital. So I go to campus, go to hospital, paint, come home, do campus work. So it was really hectic. But during the process of that, you'd get the kids watching you and and being so intrigued about what we're doing and how we're doing it and you'll be surprised a simple thing like a painting can change someone's perspective on something 
and that was the whole intention around it um, and painting in the hospital. I think that was like one of the most life-changing experiences I've had in my life and um, it's something I'd always want to do again. So I started learning more about how can we help people through painting and that's where art therapy came in. So um, I was like, okay, I need to do something, but I can't just go paint everywhere. Um, so I started doing more research about it. And with art therapy, they sit down one-on-one -on -one with someone. And with my classes, I can't exactly do that. So I take a small group of people, which is like, say, maximum 15 people. And I stand in front and instruct what they have to do. So I don't say, okay, express yourself. I help you express yourself. Um, because not everyone can just sit down and just paint how they feel. Like They'll look at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> um, so I stand up, instruct, and then I allow them to paint. And if they need help, then that's when I sit down and help them. So Sonali, with you holding uh, groups of 15 and uh, having these painting classes, yes. do you find that people that come to you are usually very emotional? Are they very... Are they going through some sort of anxiety? And do you see that in painting? I mean, is it their choice of colors? Do colors say a story when they're painting? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say colors. When I choose something to paint, um, it always has a meaning. So they're not painting anything random. Um, we try and do things that as they're painting it, and then when they look at it after, they realize, OK, I did this. I'm, I overcame something. I tried something new. And I had a time out to myself. Because the intentions of it is for you to focus on you. It's not the people around you, it's not what they're doing, how fast they painted, etc. It's, it's time for yourself. And that's why I say when people come to the class, they can come alone, etc. Because I am there to help you. Um, I don't necessarily ask them why they come, but 90% of the time they actually open up to me, which is a good thing. So, so when, you, when they come to your classes, do you sort of have a theme or do you have a uh, something outlined for them to paint? Is it just a way of me time and, and just finding your creativity and letting go of emotions and feelings or anxiety? 100% yes, it's letting go. And I can say this confidently because um, about four years ago I suffered with anxiety and depression and the only thing that was getting me through is me time with my painting and creativity. Now for other people it's not that easy to just get creative. Uh, people are open about them. Sonali, I can't paint, what am I going to do? And I was like, no, I instruct you. So I tell you step by step of what to do. So it's not like you th I'm throwing you in the deep end and just say, hey, get creative. No, it's we're giving you step by step of what to do. And with, for example, we did cherry blossoms for the cancer patients. Mm -hmm. And the cherry blossoms mean um, the fragility and shortness of life. But you've got to enjoy every moment of it. And for them, that's relatable. So I try and do things that can relate to people and their issues and how to overcome it at the same time. Okay. And with you being a BCom Law student and having to host these painting classes, uh, being happy, I mean, you're a professional and then yeah. you're running this type of initiative. How do you marry the two? I mean, how do you um, work out time? Because I'm how, how far are you into your studying? Surely that takes up a lot of time and energy for you. Um, being a UNISA student actually has its pros and cons. For me, it's because I have so much on my plate, but it's not stressful in a sense where like, oh, I have to work today. No, I love what I do and I get excited about it. So working for me is a more de-stress from my studying than anything else. So um, there is a balance when it comes to exam time and prepping for exams. I kind of take a few steps back or I try to, um, but for me, when I see an opportunity, I take it with open arms. So with the work that I do, if I see someone in need, I'm not going to say, no, I can't help you, I have exams, I'm going to try my best to help you. So it's just the discipline sense of studying and being a full-time student and working, etc. But there's my inspiration's all over, so I can't ever complain about that. And do you find you not being a psychologist, uh, does that make a difference? I mean, having these painting lessons and, say, your clients opening up to you, how do you deal with that, uh, not having gone into the psychology career? Um, to be honest, sometimes it is a lot to take in, being a normal person who <laughs> hasn't practiced how to take it in. Um, but I notice with me opening up, and telling my story, I'm able to help other people. So 
I love doing that. And um, four years ago when I was suffering with anxiety, there was no one around that you could actually talk to because no one was open about it and people were ashamed about it. And specifically in an Indian community, people be like, ah, you're overreacting or this or that. But now we're building so much awareness around it and, and you're here for the next person and you know, it's okay to talk about it and your feelings. So I think with people talking to me about it, I actually feel better um, knowing that they came out about it and they can talk about it. And, and there's people like us that are here for them to speak about their feelings. So Sonali, tell us more about the artwork that you offer. What type of artwork do you do or do your clients do or how do you instruct them? How would you know that they need some type of help or guideline? So growing up, I would always paint things that how I felt. And I was lucky enough to get this gift to express how I felt. And I realized that when I started my classes, it won't be as easy for everyone else to do that. So I picked and created my own versions of pictures with meanings and it could be nature it could be a sunrise it could be a sunflower um, there's different things that we've done and with those things honestly everything has a meaning it's just how you look at it and we recently did um, a sunrise because obviously every day the sun rises and sun sets and that implicates a new beginning so everyone at some point needs a new beginning. So I've painted that about four times, surprisingly, but different versions of it. And with that, people feel that when they see that hanging up on their wall, they know it's a new day, it's a new beginning, let's try again. So I think every time we have a class, it's to try something new. It's the painting sometimes get harder, sometimes get easier. People will actually ask me, can we do something easy? Can we do something harder? I want to challenge myself. And it's good to, I really like to interact with the people that sit in because they give me feedback and they tell me what they need and what they want. And regarding the art, there's so much to it. It's just how you see it. So I think from there, it's mainly with what the people want. So I guess every piece of art definitely has a story to tell. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and do you find that um, your clients that come to you, do they, do they come for repeated sessions or do they just feel great in one session? So for the classes that I had, um, I have had about 15. For like about seven or eight, I had the same people coming in mainly because what they felt in the first session is what they want to feel over and over again and that is a break okay. and that is a healing session and and it's doing something different it's change and change is good sometimes <laughs> um, in our case it's we allowing people to express themselves take a break talk to someone who's feeling the same thing you, you can absolutely not know the person sitting next to you but they can feel the exact same thing as you surprisingly and you'll notice during the session while it's going on and on people tend to open up that like they'll come there quiet quiet and petrified like oh my god i'm gonna paint i don't know what i'm gonna do and you'll notice that we have like i'll teach for five minutes give you the first instruction yeah. then they paint then i'll teach again then they'll paint so i'm doing it step by step with them so i'm not just leaving them like so we do it step by step and, and during those those interactions and little breaks people tend to open up okay. and say this has helped me this is what I was suffering with and I feel better now or it could even be work work can get too stressful sometimes and sure. they say we someone I did it once after work and they found that it was probably much easier to come after work because you have this crazy hectic day of work and then you just Sometime come just and just like on. oh you know I can relax I can okay. do myself We'll just take a quick ad break and when back we'll chat more to Sonali about some ways of how painting could help de-stress you as well. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to Modern and Modest with the interesting Sonali um, that's been teaching us more about pause and paint. So Sonali, we've learned so much about painting and how it could tell a story and how we could find that me time. But I'm very interested in 
um, your next movement called Wearing a Masterpiece. What is Wearing a Masterpiece all about? So Wearing a Masterpiece is hand-painted customization of clothing. I started it by painting a, the famous painting Starry Night on my jacket two and a half years ago. And when I posted that on social media, people were asking, oh, where can I get this from? Where can I buy it? I was like, guys, relax, it's my jacket. Um, I've always been a fan of fashion, so I always wanted things mm. fancy than everyone else. Um, so my sister actually, being a BCom marketing student, she's like, everything business, business, business. So she's like, okay, you have nothing to lose, just try it out. Yeah. So I actually tried it out and people were really interested in getting fancy customized clothes. Um, when I say fancy, I mean it's purely you. It's no one else. Literally you wear, people's faces are on their jackets. And um, so, do, so do you uh, create this garment or do you teach people how to create their own garments? No, no, no. this is just done purely by me. Okay. Um, this is my talent on another pieces, on another person's jacket. Um, so basically whatever my clients want, I add a bit of artwork to it mm -hmm. and I paint it on the jacket for them. So I've done tributes for people who've passed away, uh, pictures of babies where mothers aren't with their kids, they feel like they are. That was her answer one day. Okay. <laughs> and um, it's, it's stuff where you, you want it to be special. I've done gifts for people where you can't get it off the shelf from a store and that's my whole thing. If you can get it from a store, I don't do it. I, I, I do things that can't be done on a laptop, on a computer, on a phone. I do things purely from my head, with my hands and... So is this all freehand? It's all freehand, yeah. Okay, great. Um, I have a stencil for certain things. Yeah. Obviously, if it's a portrait, I need it to be exact. So I will do a stencil, etc. But I do the shading, the painting, the everything. So when you're painting, do you accessorize that where you could add maybe a bit of bling or is it purely paint? So um, I actually recently, two months ago, started a new collection of denims. Um, it's called Demoda. That means fashionable in Spanish. Okay. And those denim jackets are already customized. It doesn't mean it's hand painted, but some have fur collars, there's fur coats, there's cheetah prints, there's everything on it. So it's normal jackets that I designed mm -hmm. to be something that you can't find anywhere else. So I'm saying it's customized because it's done by me under okay. my brand and that we're selling already customized. So if people want additional painting on it, then I will go ahead and do it for them. But some people don't want something too extra. So they just want a, a fancy, cool jacket done by someone that doesn't do other things like duplicate them and seeing that it's customized and uh, it's a masterpiece yeah. what pricing are we looking at um it honestly depends on how much i'm painting and what i'm painting as we said with art there's so many different ways to see it and ways to actually do it mm -hmm. um, for example a jacket with an a4 painting on it is around 750 it just depends because there's like about eight layers of paint on it. Sure. It takes me about two weeks. There's a lot of work that gets okay. into it. Um, and I obviously do it to the best of my ability. So yeah, it honestly depends on the painting itself. And when have you launched uh, the idea of painting on clothing? I actually, um, when I started it, I approached about 15 people in Durban. That's pretty known. Um, mm -hmm the bloggers, the influencers, the models, like famous people. Um, and they were actually friends or family friends. And I'm like, guys, I want to start my business. Can you please help me? So they gave me something of theirs and I painted it. And then we did a photo shoot. And that just blew up Instagram in a good way, um, where people were just learning more about the brand and what we do. And that was like about two and a half years ago. And um, from there, it just kept growing and growing and meeting new people and trying out new materials and doing certain events and I think that's been, been amazing. So you have a very big idea that, that you're working on. Can you share with our viewers as to what is coming next with Sinatra? 
So my two brands are my babies. <laughs> so it's Pause and Painting, Wearing a Masterpiece, and I'm finally having the opportunity to combine them um, in collaboration with two amazing young women from Durban. They call Women of the World and SA Young Female Professionals. We came together to host a paint class for women who are suffering with anything, anxiety, depression, abuse, stress, anything. And, and you can come out and talk about it. But what we're doing is we're customizing t-shirts like a normal paint class, but we're just painting on clothes now <laughs> um, with the feminist logo on it. Okay. So, so however you feel, you can paint it on your t-shirt. In this sense, I'm there to guide you, but I'm not telling you what to put on because this is a lot more personal. So, we, so we're digging into wearing a masterpiece, which is personal for what you want. And we're also getting a touch of pause and paint, which is helping you um, express what you want. So we've merged that to create a safe place for women and ladies and girls um, to come in, talk, be together, share how they overcame experiences and how they can overcome them because surprisingly a lot of people are suffering with the same thing and we're just not open about it. So we, we're going to do a class of about 20 and we're going to see from then hopefully grow bigger and bigger. So, so now you, your focus seems to be quite a bit on adults and now with women. What about children? Children battle with anxiety as well. Have you ever hosted a class for kiddies? Do you plan on perhaps offering it at school? So I actually did do it at school. Okay. Um, I'm an ex-star college student. Um, so I was invited last year to do it with the matriculants. Um, matric is a probably the hardest year for <laughs> the youngsters. Um, so we did it just before their trials and um, I th the girls loved it. It was probably the most satisfaction I got because I knew the position they were in when I was in school. And Star being a fully academic school, painting was like, whoa, what's happening there? <laughs> and, especially um, at a matric level. Especially at a matric yes. level. So it's things like that that I love doing where it's the unexpected and you know it's actually helping someone. It's just as much as, as it's a fun activity, don't get me wrong, but there's so much more to it. And people shouldn't be just thinking, oh, it's arts and craft, it's okay. You know, these things can help your kid. It can help your child. It, it, you can communicate to them through a picture, not just the shouting or the talking or the normal therapy sessions. There's so much more to it that can be done. I suppose it also helps people to get over that barrier, like you just mentioned now, people are a bit apprehensive on can I paint or can't yeah. I paint. Yeah, for sure. Getting over that yeah. and just being feeling free and yeah. putting that brush Definitely. down and just expressing it more. Definitely. So Sonali, being in uh, Pause and Paint and uh, wearing a masterpiece, it's been now just over two years for you. Yes. So in this time, what do you feel you've accomplished and how has this actually, what, what was your achievement at the end of it? Um, specifically pause and paint, my goal is and always will be to help people. So whether it's doing different classes, different initiatives, or in some way I know that I've helped someone, I think that would always be my goal throughout anything I do in my life. And with pause and paint, I've done a lot of different things, which is painting in the hospital. We did a an event with the rural kids and the TB patients and the kids in the homes and normal people and you know so it's always there's always a reason for it and I think as I grow I'm, I'm there's more to learn and I'm very open to learning and how much more we can help people in a sense where you can better yourself um, with learning about illnesses or learning about life experiences, etc. So I guess at the end of it, it's about bettering yourself and the lives of other people. 100%. Quite rewarding. And is there any message you'd like to share with our viewers? Um, it would basically be to always follow your passion and trust your gut. If you don't try something, you're never going to learn. Mm -hmm. If there's no opportunity, you make the opportunity. And that's what I've learned over the years. Okay, and how would uh, our viewers get in, get in touch with you if we'd like to join your classes? Um, so I'm on Instagram and Facebook. Um, um, pause and Paint is literally pause 
and, and the letter p N paint. <laughs> okay. Um, and wearing a mask piece is just one long word. It's just wearing a mask piece. And yeah, that's it. Okay. Well, thanks for coming on to our show. Thank you and, for having um, me. And it's great that you've come up with this initiative of allowing people to just let go with something as simple as paint Painting, and a brush. Yeah. Thank okay. you so much. So that was Sonali from Pause and Paint and Wearing a Masterpiece. A uh, beautiful episode today. We've had two amazing guests. One and both of them. I think bo both our guests today. The key is just to help and uplift and making a difference to women and children and everyone out there. And until next week with myself, Noshina Ghani, please join us at 9 o'clock on Modern and Modest on Mondays.